Hello, and welcome back to the Dr. Karina Smith podcast. In today's episode, I'm interviewing good friend and fellow yin yoga teacher, Heidi Trigger. Heidi is an amazing teacher who brings a breadth of creativity and deep uh, discoveries to her yin yoga teaching. And in this episode, we talk about her journey from dance to teaching yoga to teaching yin and all of the ways in which she's bringing new experiences to her students and what she's offering in the yin yoga space right now. It's a great conversation. I hope you enjoy it. Let's get into it. Hello, Heidi. Hi, Karina. <laughs> how are you today? I'm good. How are you? <laughs> I'm fabulous. Yeah, I'm really fabulous. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So thank you so much for coming on and being a guest on my little show. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, I don't know why it took me so long to invite <laughs> you. Um, for those of you listening and watching that may not have had the, the beautiful gift of spending time with Heidi in either one of her yoga classes or her retreats or her incredible kirtans and all the other yummy offerings that Heidi has to share. Um, you're in for a real treat. This is a very special person. I'm particularly biased because she's a very good friend of mine, but um, I think you're going to really enjoy watching and listening to us hang out, I think. <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> um, so it's it's often quite nice to start um, hearing what your what your journey's been like. So you've you've taught all sorts of different things in terms of the yoga world. Um, tell us a bit about your backstory and how you came to Yin and what your relationship is with Yin yoga, and you can just take it from there. Okay, so I come from a background in dance, actually, like I think a lot of yogis do. Just uh, it, yoga, I guess asana was my pathway into yoga because it was real. Like I, I practiced yoga when I was younger, and then I had a big break from yoga, and then I got injured at dance, at dancing. So I, um, I couldn't jump anymore. So I went while I was on my kind of healing process from the injury to yoga, and then I fell back in love with it. But it was through asana, and then you know. Dance is so um, yang, such a yang movement style of the body. And then it was, I don't look, I feel like I don't really know the year, but I kind of guess it was like 2011 or 2012 when yin yoga came here to Australia. And I went to a class and I actually thought it was the, just the worst thing I'd ever done in my entire life. I was so, I was just like, what that, what, what was that even about? Like, I don't even get it. And then I went back again, at like maybe ages later when a friend said, no, Heidi, you've actually got to use the props and surrender into the shape and it's not strenuous. And I sort of had, then I had to shift my mindset about it a little bit. And then the next time I went back, I liked it. And then the more I went, I just started to fall in love with it because my body, I didn't realize was just so tight from all of those years of dancing and like, all the stretches in dance are active stretches. There's nothing in dance that allows you to just soften into the shape. Mm. So when I discovered that that was happening, because I I'm not flexible um, organically, like I'm not a flexible person, and it takes me a long time to. It's taken me all my life really to be. People look at me and think, "Oh, she's so flexible," but no, like if I didn't do what I do, I wouldn't be able to touch my toes or anything like that. And mm. then as a dancer, I was one of the really inflexible ones. And I was kind of always a little bit jealous of everyone else that they could do, like kick really high and do the splits and do all the, those sort of things. And then now I feel I'm definitely the most flexible I've ever been in my life at 48. And it's because I've allowed my body to just absolutely soften instead of having, having to look a certain way. Yeah. But isn't that just yoga? It's like, that's my favorite thing about it. It's like, it doesn't have to be or look or feel like anyone else. It's just, it just is that, you know? So that's kind of, that was kind of my gateway in. And I didn't instantly fall in love with yin yoga. Like I know a lot of people do, I didn't. It took me a little bit of time to, to find my love for it. But then it's like really, you know, my favorite, my favorite now. I love it. <laughs> what do you love about it? 
I love that the fact that it, uh, it it softens my body as opposed to making it harder like it, it's for instance right so if you think of dragonfly in yin and then like it would be prasarita in like vinyasa or hatha style yoga but in dance it's called second position right so you're sitting in second position on the floor or dragonfly on the floor and in dance it's like your feet have to be pointed your knees have to be pointing up and there's a certain way you come forward sort of like you would in um, maha mudra i guess so everything has to be flat back flat tight so i just couldn't ever get past to kind of that angle shape like a i don't know what's that a 45 degree angle shape really now if i'm hanging out in dragonfly for five minutes i can my head will touch the ground and every mm. because everything's softer and it's not so much about trying to ex externally rotate it's more like of an internal rotation where it's just soft it just yeah. allows my body to be there I mean, let alone all of the other benefits it has, you know, on the meridian lines and all of the other things that happen for you when you're in there. But that, just that alone, it's kind of, you just can't buy that. You can't buy that energy. Mm. Mm. So amazing. The, um, the anatomist in me uh, is curious about whether or not those very particular alignment cues in Upavishta Kanasana or um, second position that you were doing in ballet that there might have been something going on structurally where the head of your femur as it tries to be pushed out that way was catching and then in yin where you're allowed to just let your leg bones roll where they naturally can roll because of the shape of your bones the hamstrings were open enough to just let you come forward a hundred percent and then like that whole thing like i never knew that there was different shaped heads of the but like the hip joints were different like I never knew that some people had really round plates and some people so I just thought I'm just not flexible but maybe the maybe mine's like a, a almost like a circle and it just doesn't go any further than that and that was wow. like also mind-blowing I, I just I was like oh my god I'm free okay <laughs> I, this is just who I am it's cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And how, I mean, how, how are people to know? I mean, it's not until I studied with Paul and he's done this incredible work of sharing all those bone pictures, which he yeah. asks people to continue sharing so that people can be educated. You can't see into the bones. And like you, I've come from a ballet background where, and I bet it's the same in gymnastics. I bet it's the same in other movement practices because I've heard that it is, that there is this understanding that because you can't see the bones, everyone must have identical variation. And obviously that I'm something I'm very passionate about, but yeah, you're right in yin, it's not about that. And therefore what I'm hearing in you is that it actually gave you a, a pathway to access parts of your body that you thought you'd never be able to access because that was just your story. I'm just not flexible, or this is as far as I'll go, or this is as good as it will get. And um, 100%. yeah. And it's just, yeah, and it's so freeing to, un yeah. to, to know that it's actually not because there's something wrong with me. It's just that that's normal because no one is the same. Yeah, it was actually Paul Grilly's pictures that I, I like that. That's what illuminated it for me because I had no idea before he shared all of that stuff, which was just yeah. so amazing and life changing for so many people so life-changing so amazing and if people that are listening and or watching are thinking what are these bone pictures you're talking about if you go to paul grilly's website which i'm pretty sure is just paul grilly g-r-i-l-l-e-y dot com i'll put that in the show notes there's a very clear tab on that website that's got a whole bunch of pictures of bone specimens side by side with a little a little brief description about what it is that you're looking at and how the differences in those bones will implicate certain planes of movement in the body. Not because someone's practiced more or less than another person, but just the, these are, these are the facts of that body. And it shouldn't be seen as a, a criticism. It's just, it's who you are. And that can, that can be celebrated rather than thought of as a shortcoming. Yeah, and it's not just your hips, it's your shoulders and your neck and your knees and your ankles and every joint, your feet. I mean, in ballet, you know, you meant to have that your feet, if you can point your foot, you know, in an extreme amount, then you have beautiful feet. But then some people just can't because they have this 
part of their ankle that just won't do that. Especially I see it a lot in guys, a lot of men yeah. couldn't, couldn't ever do that. And it's mm. just, that's the way their, their bones are shaped in their body. And how amazing mm. that we know that now. And it doesn't mean that they're any, any less of a dancer or any less of a person or any less flexible. They just don't have the bones that allow their body to look like that other person who has those bones. So crazy. Yeah. So amazing. <laughs> Oh, I have I have a, a couple of questions I want to ask you about what you've shared so far and I, I want to make sure we come back and talk about the feet because what you've just said I think will take us into a really good discussion. But I think when you said that some people fall in love with yin yoga straight away but you didn't, mm. I find that there is a big slice of people that are in that same camp that you were in that come to the yin class, it's very foreign, it doesn't really make sense, it's very different to the way they've moved before and there's a massive resistance to it. But there's a, there's a big slice of that slice that end up falling in love with it. And I'm quite curious about what it is that enticed you to come back and give it another go and just see what it was about when it was, um, yeah, initially there was this feeling of what the hell is this? I, this is not for me. What, what helped you to get in there? Well, I think, you know, having someone else say that, it, that it wasn't about, it wasn't Yang, like someone else described to me of, you know, their experience, actually, it was their experience of, you know, she sort of said, you know, no, Heidi, you've got to get the props and you've got to get the bolster and the blanket and the things. And then, you know, you're in the shape and then you can just stay there, but you can use all of that to support you. And then I, there was that. But then also on the side of that, I have to say, there was also another element of trust that it was yoga and that I trusted yoga. And mm. there must be something in it if it's yoga as well. Cause it's, although it's yin, it's yin yoga. It's, it's still yoga. So. Mm. That was also a part of me that I thought, you know, there must be something in it if it's yoga. So I'm going to try it again. And then I think also, look, to be honest, just like in everything, your teacher will also be a huge, the, the, if, you, if you have a relation, like if you have a connection to the teacher or if you have a certain amount of trust that they can contain the space, especially if it's something like yin where, you know, you get to hang out there for a while, you're in a shape for a while, a long time, and it can be really uncomfortable in there. And if the teacher can hold that space for you as well, I think that also made a bit, very big difference because, mm. yeah, the teacher, the teacher, mm. the trust yeah. in trust. That, you've, that you've got someone to hold the space for you, especially if you're new to the practice. You know, and I see that a lot as a teacher, like people coming to the club to class, just going, oh, my God, what, you know, it's a lot, you know, and, and everybody has different bodies. Like we were talking about before, there are so many of us that are inflexible and there are so in our bodies. And then and then there are a lot of people out there that have the opposite. They're super hyper mobile and they also need the same amount of care in, in a way that they need to be propped as well. But yeah. you know, that's another story. That's another mm. Discussion. Yeah. yeah, I love that insight. And what I tend to find with people that have mm. that massive resistance, but do pursue it, whatever it is that inspires them to pursue it, they actually end up falling madly in love with it. Mm. What I hear sometimes from people is that they have this massive realization that they they've there's nowhere else, there's nowhere, there's been nowhere in their life before that they've had the space to be slow and quiet mm. and mindful. And that initially was the thing that made them go, what is this? This is so foreign to me. I'm extraordinarily uncomfortable. I can't even explain why I'm out of here. Mm. But the, the need, you know, like when your nervous system gets so wired and so sympathetic, trying to sit still feels really uncomfortable. Yeah until it can begin to regulate and then you, you you sit still and go oh i can enjoy this now i feel like something happens to people on that journey of falling in love with you and it's in those moments where you like you actually surrender when it's like okay i can just i can just let myself go it's okay i've got like i'm supported i'm held everything is safe and then you can let go that's when the magic happens i mm. feel that's when mm. real that's yeah that's when yoga starts that's when i let go as soon as i let go that's when the yoga begins and that's when the journey happens and that's when 
transformation happens. Yes, yes. Something else that you shared about your history as a mover and how it's taken you like a long, consistent journey of caring for your tissues in a particular way for them to be supple. Um, do you do, do you feel like you're at a nice balance point where you've got openness and strength in your body? I know people people always have this notion that yin yoga is dangerous and that it's going to sublax your joints or it's going to overstretch your your ligaments and um i want to put a little footnote here that if if you've ever had that thought crop into your mind and it's a really normal thought to have i really encourage you to go and take a listen to the yoga land podcast that they did with bernie clark because he speaks to that beautifully Mm -hmm. but i'm just wondering because you were you had a pretty intense dance um, schedule and you danced for ages and you were a dance teacher. Mm. Um, yeah. What's, what's it like to be in your body now having come from a place that's been quite stiff and strong, like strong stability to then have a bit more mobility in your connected tissue. What is it? What's it like? Oh, it's so amazing. Like I, like I said before, I never thought I was this, my body could do these things. I thought that my body was that that's as far as it could get. Like, you know, I'd been dancing for a very long time and it was still, you know, like I had a lot of mobility and I had a lot of flexibility and I say that I couldn't kick, but I could kick high, like I was kicking right up to my ear. So I was, you know, and I was in the splits and stuff, but it was still, there was like this, it was like my muscles did not have permission to let go, that there was like this energetic or maybe a subconscious was thing happening in my mind saying to my muscles, don't let go, don't let go. And there was always a fear of injury as well. Like in the back of my head, I was like always, okay, make sure that everything's strong and stable. And I think that was just a constant thought in the back of my mind because you know, with yoga, it's a, yoga means to unite and we're uniting all of the parts of us. So it's not just, it's not just the physical, it's the, the, the mental and the emotional stuff that goes along with yin yoga. And, you know, like how many times have I cried in yin yoga? Many. Mm. <laughs> how many times have I cried on the mat? I don't know. I can't count anymore. I've lost count. But that, but that's a release of all of the things, not just with the tears, but just with the, with the limiting self-belief that I, if I don't do it this way that I've been conditioned to do it in, in my body, and this can just go to end, you can use this and insert that sentence in any part of my life, really. If I don't do this in a certain way that I've been conditioned to do it, then I will be hurt, injured, won't be able to do it anymore, and mm. who knows what's going to happen. And there's a really honest fear of the unknown if I didn't do it that way. But mm. yin, yo, yin yoga really allowed me to surrender my body to being how it, how it needs to be. And you can also insert that sentence into other parts of my life as well. But because it starts, it really starts, you know, in this time in the world, in the Western world, in the way we live, in the outer layer, right, whether you want to call it Anamaya Kosha or whatever you want to call it, but I feel like the gateway in for me was definitely through the body, the matter, to get into the parts inside that were unseen and unknown and actually unconditioned. And once I got into the unconditioned parts and started to trust in myself, yoga, then I could really let go. And then now, because my body is so free from yin yoga i feel like there is a much more beautiful balance within me in not but then it's not just the body it's like in every aspect of my life now it's like the body is just kind of like a reflection or a mirror or just the outer layer of what's really happening inside which is more softening more flexibility more trust more surrender um, a deeper knowing and and less fear in the unknown of I think I, I know now that I can really just let go and hang out in a shape for a long time I'm not going to get injured and it's actually going to feel amazing you know wow wow what a gift that mm. that pathway has um, been 
for the way you relate to your world and so great yeah especially that last thing that you just said because yeah it sounded like if I color out of the lines in any way here I'm in danger yes yes and this practice of of coming up to the moment of surrender and and trusting my friend that said babe use the props yeah but they're there lean into some support you don't have to do it all on your own and a teacher that can hold the space and you go all right I'm going to let go here I'm going to let go here oh this is nice I'm okay yeah oh how does this and and probably consciously slash unconsciously that then became a way of feeling into different things in your life that's amazing Mm mm-hmm yeah, yeah so great how great's yoga it's just great. Like, it's the gift that keeps on giving it's the best friend that never leaves your side you know it's mm. just the best so yeah. Amazing. Mm. yeah i haven't taught a flow class for a number of years now and i'm it's definitely bubbling around in there how i might reapproach teaching flow And I know that you've taught a lot of flow and that's been more your mainstay than yin yoga. Correct me if that's wrong. Um, To me, if I was to step back into that space, it would definitely be teaching flow in a yin way, (laughs) which means bringing the idea of target areas to flow yoga, where instead of it being alignment based, it would be intention based. And for like an example of that that I might give is that if 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 people were coming into a back bend, for example, and the structural shape of their back bend meant that they always get a, a really painful pinch in their lumbar spine when they come into full wheel, that they could just do a different back bend. Yeah. That it's not about the posture itself being this transformational thing that only exists in that posture. Because in every single back bend, the spine's gonna do almost identical to what it will do in another back bend, depending on how much force you put through it. Mm-hmm. And you teach flow and you're acutely aware of things like the pointed feet that we talked about before. I'm wondering how your revelations in yin yoga affect the way that you teach flow. So what you said just now is how I teach flow. So awesome. I teach exactly the same. It's the same with all of the things that I teach. So I know that everybody's body is different and I, I, I might offer full wheel, but you could also do supported bridge or bridge and it would be exactly the same target area as you call it, because I, I teach, I like thematics for me is everything I'm teaching every single class that I teach. So yin workshops, kirtan, everything has an intention behind it. So like, okay. So if, for instance, I'm teaching a whole class on Ganesha and it would be, you know, all about connecting to the earth and the space beneath you. And so then you'd think, okay, that's legs. Okay. So if, for instance, I was teaching a yin class, it might not be a meridian class if I was teaching a Ganesha class, for instance, but I might teach the earth, the earth element. And then in that, there'd be a lot of, you know, legs and maybe I'd do like a hip mandala or something, but then feet. But so, okay. So let's talk about if I was going to teach uh, Paschimottanasana or Caterpillar, right? So it's like the same shape Mm -hmm. and everybody's in class and I'm teaching Caterpillar and then I get everyone into Caterpillar with their bolster and everything and props and everything, whatever they want. And I give them like six different options of props and whatever they want to take and whatever they don't. If I'm teaching that same shape in a Vinyasa class or flow class, I would offer up props I would say also now I often say if you'd like to make this a more yin like shape you're welcome to soften it and make your have a round spine and soft back and soft shoulders and arms look to be honest I feel like maybe a quarter of the class might do that so there's a whole heap of people who still like that dynamic sensation in their body and they're welcome to it but again it's still we're still connecting to the same essence and energy so because energy Although, again, I said before that the body and movement moves my way in, that's not, you know, after teaching yoga and teaching dance, because I taught dance for a long time, from teaching dance, 
which is really quite, you know, trying to get everybody to look as similar as they possibly can and trying to get everybody have the same expression on their face kind of as they can as well at the same time. Whereas now we're coming from a place inside more so coming from an intention of, an intention of, okay, I would really, my intention is that everyone feels a sense of safety because it's a Ganesha class. Everybody feels like they're protected. If I was to say, you all have to look exactly the same and you have to do this shape, I don't think that I would be fulfilling my intention if I was to do that, <laughs> you know. So it doesn't really matter now. I don't really mind if you do Paschimottanasana Tanasana or Caterpillar. It won't, it won't, it won't affect your practice. In fact, it'll be better for your practice if you choose Caterpillar, <laughs> if that's what you need in your body, right? Mm. Yeah, and the, the conundrum is that absolute unison in a group of people moving is impossible anyway because yeah. the foundations of the bodies are different. Here we come back again to the bone structures, right? Yeah. It's like how can everybody have the same amount of external rotation when our hips are all different? We just can't. There's just no way. And then, I, you know, like going back to a kid when I was a kid, We'd all be on the floor and we'd be in second position and dragonfly and the teacher would go around and push us down and open our legs out trying to get us all flat in a pancake and i i just couldn't i just couldn't so i wasn't as good as everyone else because i just couldn't because my bones wouldn't do that so i always had this thought in my mind that I was just never good enough and it's still there like this is one of my limiting beliefs just from when I was a kid as a dancer not having hips that just didn't have the right joint that looked the same as my best friend Kylie you know what I mean so yes. so crazy isn't it just so crazy it is so crazy and I, there are two things I want to kind of add to that one is I have the exact same mm -hmm. belief that came from the exact same experiences and two the the dance teachers that we had didn't know this about bones. No. Nobody, nobody il illuminated this for me until I went to India and studied a teacher training there. And for the anatomy module, they just put on Paul Grilly's DVD. And at the time I thought, gosh, that's lazy. But I look back and think that was genius. <laughs> yeah. I didn't get it at the time. I wrote yeah. all these notes. I didn't get it at the time. I, I, that, that material came back to me a handful more times before I really clicked and went, oh, I see what he's trying to do here. And that material is brilliant because he's got people from very opposite ends of the spectrum showing you the difference. Yeah. And I, I was studying at a university where we were looking at cadavers and in-depth anatomy and nothing about the anatomy included variation. It was just the names of things and the pathways of things. And then where, you know, a vein runs here these joints do this, these are their planes of motion, but nothing in there was about skeletal variation. And I've said that a lot to students. I've said, if you go and watch Paul Grilly's anatomy material, you'll be learning much better content than you would if you went and studied anatomy at a university level straight up. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. It's really life changing. And especially yeah. as teachers, when you're looking at, at you know, 30 or 20 or even 10 people and they all look completely different and if you're not aware that they will have different bodies or different shaped bones then to put them try and get them all into the same shape is just for the detriment of everybody including yourself mm -hmm. it's wild and it's so simple yeah. it's so simple <laughs> it's simple and it's um completely earth shattering at the same time yeah <laughs> <laughs> So it sounds like, and I'd love for you to share where you, where, what you're exploring now, because it sounds like for you, it's definitely been the body is the entry and, and now it's all this internal landscape, which is such a beautiful progression. And I know that in your yin offerings and in your yin teachings and the classes that you do, I just, you know, things that you did in classes that I joined were just extraordinary in terms of the way you would frame a class or the, the, you know, the pathway that you might invite us to explore during a posture. I'd love for you to share with us what this, what this deepening is that mm. you're exploring now. Within. So that's what's really exciting for me because I, I didn't know how to do it. 
and no one ever taught me how to do it. And it was like something that I had to just figure out for myself, I guess. And I'm not saying that no one else does it, but I, I didn't, like I'd never done, I'd done lot, I don't know, hundreds of yin classes with teachers who are really great. Um, but I, there, no one had ever taught me what to say when people were in their shape. And whenever I did a yin class, I'd just get a lot of information about a meridian line or um, anatomy, really, or alignment. Okay, so, or, or what the target area was or something like that, which is great. But I started getting more interested in what would it be like if I was to connect uh, a pranic energy, like a, a breathing into a particular meridian line. So what would that feel like? So I started practicing that and then I started teaching it and watching how it um, changed the energy of the experience of the people who are in my classes and how they felt with it. So it was almost like um, I would, you know, depending on it, if it was a yin or a yang shape or a yin or a yang meridian line, to direct the breath up or direct the breath down. So it was like an Apanavayu or a Pranavayu, but with a meridian. So I was starting to connect all of the things that I'd learned in my Tantra trainings and my Vinyasa, sorry, that's my dog, my Vinyasa trainings to the yin shapes. So because we're there for so long, like we're in shapes for sometimes five minutes, it gives you a really amazing opportunity to stay with the breath or with, an, with a practice, like a meditation practice or a directional practice of prana for a while so that you can really connect to a practice that is deeper whilst mm. you're also in a shape that is connecting to a meridian. So then there's an intention of, you know, lungs, say detox, uh, sorry, uh, liver, which is like a detox practice. And then you can bring the energy up the outer seam of the leg at the same time as you're connecting to the outer seam of the leg, like maybe if you're in sleeping swan or something for a while. So mm. then I started doing that. And then we can add things like color or mantra or sound or, I don't know, heaps of other different layers on top of that. Or maybe there's a, a layer of an element on top of that. We can lay a water onto it or a, a, a shape of the breath you can count and with the counts you can then lay a mantra into the counts instead of a, a one two three four and om four times or something like that so then it even gets deeper and deeper again and then when and how to layer that then i had to explore that so then okay so how how can i connect the heart meridian to a heart based mantra and a practice of breath that opens up the heart space as well and then connect that maybe with the heart chakra so everything just gets more and more layered so every time you're in a shape there's a practice so it's not just about okay your your heart meridian line starts at the heart and then it goes up into the tip of the tongue or whatever like that but it's literally like Okay, so I'm going, so how about you push the tip of your tongue to the top layer of the gums and you like move your tongue across the gums. So it's not me telling you this is where your tongue mm. ends, but it's you are having a sensation and experience of the tongue line in your own body without me even meaning to tell you that that's where your tongue meridian is. Do you know what mm. I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a different, it's like, I don't know, I feel like, that that's kind of that's a, a gateway in that was I don't know it, it kind of just organically happened because that's with all of this so I did my um my yin training with Sarah Powers and she talks she speaks to the Marinians a lot but she she or she's beautiful beautiful and she had she knows she's given us all of these texts and things to read and beautiful pathways but I just couldn't match them up with the way that I was teaching and the way that yin yoga was for me so although she's such a huge inspiration and I adore her and love her and when I think about her I even now just think about her and I feel held because she's so amazing it was I still had to find my own way in and of course you know you have to anyway because otherwise it's kind of not authentic to who you are, but I 
I did that over, I guess, a space of maybe five years it took for me to mm. really figure it out. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And that speaks to me of the difference between just giving information as a teacher mm. and reeling off information that someone has read or learnt about the pathway of a meridian and actually giving the students in the class the invitation to embody that information yeah however however it's received because in those spaces and in yin yoga classes um the brain waves change and you can you can really drop down from a cog cognitive place to a a dreamy place and mm. a imaginary place and uh, a scope of a scope of an idea like feeling into the tongue or the eyes or mm. having you and your extraordinary voice chant in the room and let the chant flow through a meridian or something because I know you do extraordinary work like that it's also got the room for interpretation and I think that that's really important because um, sometimes people try and give give a very strong practice to be done and it can feel rigid yes yeah it's an invitation and it's not it's not really it's totally unnecessary and if you don't want to do any of it and all you want to do is go to shavasana for the whole 60 minutes you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> but then also i i i realized too that it's kind of a bit a lot of these practices that i'm sharing and inviting people into can feel quite weird i guess they're a bit they're they're weird because it's not it's certainly not western world culture practices they're definitely eastern practices and particularly with la the layering of mantra and and the chanting that i do which is certainly not pop music <laughs> and it's a completely different energy but that that is also weird and i feel like you know, maybe it's either you love it or you hate it, but you definitely don't have to do it either. Right. And and mm -hmm. I also, like you said before, everybody's going to have their own experience of yoga. Everybody's going to have their own experience in the shape, in the practice. They're going to feel different. Everyone's sleeping swan experience will feel different, you know. And the I think one of the, the greatest things that Sarah Powers taught me, and it took me a very long time to actually understand it and feel it and be it, is to be comfortable in other people's discomfort. And I think mm -hmm. that's what the pressure was for me because I was so uncomfortable watching people, like, you know, with different bodies to me in a shape that I could tell they were really uncomfortable in, like saddle pose or even sleeping swan and stuff. And I'd be like, I'd be sitting there. I wasn't even doing the shape and I'd be sweating. I'd be watching them sweating because I could see that they were just so uncomfortable in it. But I think then when I started to invite them to go deeper in and to surrender into their shape, which is what, what helped me to love yin yoga, to get to offer them a pathway inward so that it wasn't all about their physical experience it was they could go inward and have a, a, a maybe a pranic experience or a vibrational experience or a, a an inner vision so that they could get out of their head and more into what was happening in an experience for them that wasn't so painful or uncomfortable mm. you know yeah and then Wonderful. Selfishly, I think that's probably what started to make me or to help me to create this kind of method was because I was selfishly uncomfortable watching everyone be uncomfortable. And that was what Sarah's teaching was. It was like every there are people that are going to be really uncomfortable in some shapes and in the same shape, there'll be someone sitting next to them that will be in pure bliss. Yeah. I love, for instance, I love saddle pose. I am in bliss in that shape i love it so much give it to me every day but i know that there are people who absolutely probably pray they walk in and pray please don't give me saddle pose in this class today and they're mm. in it and they 
I don't know, I feel like if I'm in a shape that's uncomfortable for me, I know that if I'm breathing and if I'm following something else, it takes me out of my head and out of the discomfort into something internal that's that's more peaceful and harmonious, you mm-hmm. know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, helping people get out of their own head and back into their body in a sense yeah. or ch- changing being able to shift their perspective about what's happening. Yeah. Yes. The big one. What I really love about what you're sharing that you're exploring in class, and I don't think it's selfish at all because Mm. what we witness as teachers and what our teach, what our students teach us informs us how to be better teachers. And then to recognize that there's probably a bunch of other yin teachers that might be going through the same sort of struggle, trying to, trying to figure out a way to develop a deeper method or a deeper way of holding space because to be comfortable when someone else is not comfortable is to me the definition of holding space yeah and just being okay with what happens for them even if it's not what you think should happen yeah or, or not having any shoulds at all yeah which is yeah. a practice in itself <laughs> and you teach teachers you offer trainings in helping people to develop more skills to go deeper into their yin teaching and I really love that too because sometimes I find yin teachers for a period of time and this is probably a rite of passage they they want to play it safe but there there's not a lot of people out there offering trainings and you you really develop this yourself where they learn how to really utilize creativity and yin yoga has so much scope for creativity because the selection of postures is simple unless you do a lot of variations and then it's massive yeah (laughs) but then how do you how do you as a teacher find your own flavor of creating an environment or an immersion where people can go into deeper aspects of even their their psychic self or their their energetic self their etheric self if they feel comfortable to do so rather than it be a bit dry and i'm just going to give you verbatim information about the liver organ which is a bit too intellectual for my liking and doesn't really mean anything yeah um could you speak to that a little bit yeah oh that's what i I, this is so this is me i could talk about this for about five days Okay, so so yes, I feel like so if you think of yin as being so let's just say basically there's only like 15 shapes, really, there's not that many, there's just an amount of shape. I don't know, I just made up that number, but let's just say 15. In within those 15, like you said, you can have a million different variations with using props and variations with the legs and everything. So if you look at it in that way, you can also say that that there is 15 different ways in. But within your scope of psychic ability or imagination or creativity, there are millions of different pathways. So I'm really just teaching the basics saying, okay, so here's a, this is a pathway. Mantra is a pathway. The mantra om, you can use the mantra om to infuse into a particular meridian line, or you can infuse it into a chakra or infuse it into a, I don't know, just your leg or, you know, pranically, whatever you like. Now, now you take that away with you and with your own unique creativity, go with it. How would you use OM in a practice? What if the whole theme of the practice was OM and that's the Mm. only, that's the only, that's it, OM. How would you break that down, OM, in a million ways, which you can, how can you break OM in a million ways in your way, in your unique creative way, and infuse that into a practice yeah. and give you give yourself permission to use it and give yourself permission to do something that no one has ever done before and that's exciting that's exciting for me you know rocking up to a yoga class uh, your any yoga class and it's just different and I feel something on a different level to just the asana just the body but I actually feel like I've left and something in me has shifted. Something in me has changed and it might be subtle or it might be really significant, but I feel it. That's 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 what I love. That's what I that's what I'm that's my intention as a teacher and to teach these deeper practices is that to empower 
yoga teachers to walk away feeling like they have their their the their power to create something that is beautiful and unique and new to them that mm. people were people will line up to come to their yin yoga classes because it's so extraordinary and because every time they do their class something shifts and they feel different when they leave that's oh. what I'm for it yeah what an exquisite intention oh yeah sorry that was my bell okay. perfect <laughs> just pump it like, like, yes. beautifully <laughs> ding ding <laughs> on the bell <laughs> Ah, oh, and and so while we're on that topic of teachers, and you teach teachers, yeah. do you have like a handful of tips or gems, or if you were speaking to audience members now that are teaching Yin Yoga, what what advice would you give, or what would you what would you share for them? Um, for, I think first of all, that 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 little gem that Sarah says is that to be um, comfortable in others' discomfort. I think that's probably as a yin teacher the most invaluable lesson i have ever learned that's probably number one and that's sarah's but i'm gonna just reiterate that and put an exclamation mark and an underline under that because it's so amazing um i also think to put the books away forget about all of the books and trust in your own knowing your own inner knowing and from what you've already learned and experienced as a yogi as well i think it's i think it's really important for us to trust that we have everything within us that we that we need right now in this moment and if you close if you close the book close your phone close everything close your eyes and tap into the energy of the room and know that what you give them and what you invite them into will be absolutely perfect for what they need right now. They've come to you for a reason today, even if they don't know it and even if you don't know it, you're all there in this space together because you all need to experience that one thing that you're just about to invite them in and hold the container for. Trust mm -hmm. in it. Trust that it's going to be absolutely perfect absolutely perfect for what you need and for what they need and the words that come out of your mouth are going to be exactly right mm -hmm. i think that's a big one too but i but i think to that 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 trust goes even a little bit deeper and it goes to trust that if you make a mistake that it's going to be I'm, I just have to go because the mistake thing is a hard thing as well. And it was a really challenging one for me because from a dance background, we weren't allowed to make them. So if we mm. made a mistake, we'd get in big trouble. And, you know, like if you go to an audition and you make a mistake, you don't get in. And if you, you know, make enough mistakes, you're out completely. So it's, it's, it's a hard one, right? You know this too. It's really, really, you know, a hard one to get out of. But there's a goddess in yoga mythology named Saraswati. Now, she's the goddess of creativity. She's the goddess of the arts and poetry and sequencing yoga asana and thematics and everything in yoga, right? She asks us to be as uniquely us, you. She's asking you to be as uniquely you as you can be. And she loves mistakes. <laughs> because when we make a mistake, that is then creating something new. So imagine if I said, I, you came along and did a yin training. We all did one together and we'd never done one before. And you and I were there and, you know, maybe 10 of our other friends. So there were 12 of us there and we all did a yin training. And the teacher said, now you're only ever allowed to teach this sequence in this way from now until the rest of time. Mm. So we went off and we did that then everyone else did as well. So no one else has ever done anything else. You're not allowed to use any different props. You're only allowed to do dragonfly this way, sleeping swan this way, caterpillar this way, and it has to look A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and that's it. We wouldn't, first of all, we wouldn't be sitting here. Second, <laughs> there wouldn't be the props. There wouldn't be the beautiful, um, you know, different pathways in, like so many, out there are so many amazing teachers out there that have, um, that have very geniusly discovered 
different ways to use props that just support in the most amazingly magnificent ways that I would never have come up with myself. So some of these ways to use props is so epic these days, it just blows my mind. Um, that's not my, um, I'm not, that's not my, um, what's the word? Mercury retro. Bag. With my head bag. That's not my bag. <laughs> <laughs> my bag is other things, but their bag is so amazing. I love their bag. And I, and I borrow from their bag um, because I, like, I look at these different bodies again, here we are with their different bones. And I'm like, I couldn't, I wouldn't have ever thought to use a block in that way, but now I know I can do it. This mm. person is loving their experience. So that's great. But Saraswati is asking us to change things up, make things look different, make a mistake so that from that mistake you go, oh, actually, I didn't do that the way that Karina Smith taught me how to do it. But now that I'm here doing it this way, it actually works better for Jane. So I'm going to give this to Jane mm. from now on because Jane loves this. Or mm. Heidi taught me that that I have to do om in this I have to chant the mantra on um, this way, but I did it this way today. And when I did it this way, it actually worked better. So I'm going to do this from now on. A mistake mm -hmm. in my eyes can be something magnificent for somebody else. So I think we have to really let go of things being perfect and things being the way that we've been taught in a way. With, look, we've got to understand that there are obviously basic boundaries and rules that we have to use in our, as, as a teacher, of course. But beyond, within those boundaries and within those guidelines and rules, there is an infinite potential for magic to happen. And I feel like, you know, that magic only happens when we allow ourselves to make a mistake and be unique and beautifully who we are, beautifully you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Permission to explore. Yeah. Permission to explore. It makes me think of something that I heard Thomas Myers say once. He said, and this is just purely talking about the health of connective tissue and hydrating tissue from, from moving. He's like, every now and then, do your yoga practice badly, quote unquote. Mm. Like, make, yeah. be, be weird in the shapes. Don't be yes. regimented in the, the, dog, the dogma of the shapes because there's certain parts of your tissue that are never getting, uh, never getting any attention because you're always doing it exactly the same way. I love that. I love that mm. so much. You can just use that little sentence in anything. Every so often, breathe wrong. Every so yeah. often, breathe badly. <laughs> Every so often, dance wrong. Every so often, walk weird. Act badly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, just for you, and you can see if you've discovered something new or if it's, you know, keep exploring. <laughs> oh, so, Heidi, how can people? How can people find out about what you're doing or get in contact with you if they want to connect? I have a website. I'm, yeah. I'm okay at updating it, although I'm much better at updating my Instagram page. So that's probably the best way to find out what's happening. I'm kind of on that every couple of days and I'm adding new things, kirtans and workshops and trainings and classes and all sorts of little things. Yeah, retreat. Heidi runs a lot of retreats as well. Yep. Um, for those of you that are in Australia or want to come to Australia for one of Heidi's retreats. So we'll make sure we put all of those in the show notes as well. So if you want to, yeah, find out a little bit more about how you can come and ex experience one of Heidi's classes or come and take part in an immersion or all the other wonderful things that she's doing, we'll have that there for you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for such a great conversation. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. It was such a pleasure. Oh. So great. I mean, we could do this. We could do this every day anyway. We could. <laughs> but um, we, we thought that people would enjoy us hanging out. And I, well, I feel confident that they have. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Heidi. Thank you, beautiful. Mm. Love you. And thank you so much. Love you. <laughs> thank you so much for listening, everybody. Thank Bye you. for now.